Um, there's only 2.6 million people in Western Australia, and the majority of those live on the coast, and three quarters of them actually live in Perth, which is the state, the capital of the state. Um, in terms of iron ore production, this was actually mentioned yesterday, but we produce 98% of Australia's total iron ore, and um, the two key areas where, where that is is the Pilbara, which is shown on that map, and um, this is known as the Midwest or the Yulgarn area, and that produces 10%. And um, Western Australia is the world's highest exporter. So Mark touched on this yesterday, so I won't go through it, so I can make my 30 minutes. Um, so it's an ancient landscape. In particular, I was just going to mention the range, which is known as Jack Hills, and it's in the Midwest area that I showed you where 10% of the iron ore comes from. And it supports the oldest known rocks in the world, the zircon crystals there that are the earliest known. Um, there's extraordinary richness um, in subterranean fauna and diversity, and I won't go into the other details because Mark talked about those, but there's an estimated 4,000 species in Western Australia alone. And the slide on the left, this slide, oh, wrong one, sorry. This slide here, this is the Midwest, and this is the Pilbara. This is just a selection of some of the subterranean fauna. I won't go into any detail on those, but just to give you an idea. And these are sort of three of the most important um, geologies for subterranean fauna. There's others that we thought in the past didn't have subterranean fauna that have since been found to have them. But the one that I'll be concentrating on the most, oh, sorry. The one that I'll be concentrating on most today um, is the banded iron formations in the Pilbara that I talked about and in the Midwest here. Okay, so who are the Environmental Protection Authority? Um, the authority was established in 1971. Um, it's an independent authority. It's not government and it's not subject to ministerial um, direction. So basically, they can come up with whatever information they like and whatever decisions or recommendations they like. Um, and it, as far as I know, it's the only one of its kind, certainly in Australia. And that's actually quite significant. Um, and in terms of, um, they're governed by the Environmental Protection Act, which was um, developed in 1986. Uh, and the top, the Environmental Protection Act, it basically requires the EPA to use its best endeavours to protect the environment. Now, other acts that are relevant are the Wildlife Conservation Act, which is a state act, in particular in relation to species, because it doesn't allow any species to knowingly go extinct. And so the EPA have to consider that in their consideration of the environment. Uh, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act is the Commonwealth Act, and that lists species and communities and assemblages um, and there are listed in both of those acts um, subterranean fauna assemblages and species. So who are the EPA? These are, there are five, oh, it seems to stop. Who are the, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So who are the EPA? There are five member boards. This is only four of them. Um, but basically this is out on site, and this again is in the Midwest, in the area where I showed you where 10% of the iron ore is. The chairman is the one with the, the sunnies, sort of the third one, the tall one. Okay, so what are their main functions? So their main functions are um, to conduct environmental impact assessment, which I'll talk a bit about today. Also preparing statutory policy for environmental protection and preparing and publishing guidelines, and I'll talk about those today specifically in relation to subterranean fauna. They can also provide strategic advice to the minister on anything they choose to. And the minister can all also ask them to provide him with it or her with advice. <coughs> and that's the environment minister. Just, just quickly, this is how EIA works in Western Australia. So first up, a proponent will put in a referral, they'll refer it to the EPA. An environmental impact assessment will then subsequently take place. The EPA will then um, 
report publicly and provide advice and recommendations to the minister, there will then be a series of, then, uh, there's an appeal period, and during that period, members of the public, other companies, whoever wants to, can put in an appeal, either for or against various aspects of that assessment. And then the minister will have the final say and will indicate whether the proposal can be implemented, which means whether it can go ahead. So if it's a yes or a no, um, and then the proposal will be implemented. So the EPA uses a range of things when they consider assessments, but the main thing is these, there are actually 17 there, but 15 what are known as environmental factors. And the EPA has to consider each of those environmental factors in, a, in an impact assessment. Now, it may decide that 10 of them aren't relevant to a particular proposal. Um, the one we're obviously focusing on today is subterranean fauna, but in the area I, I work, we look at terrestrial fauna, flora and vegetation, landforms, and terrestrial environment quality. Now, there's two other offsets and rehabilitation and decommissioning. They're not factors that are actually assessed, but they're considered through the assessment, um, you know, if the assessment is approved towards the end. So, in terms of um, how those factors affect a proposal, um, subterranean fauna comes under what's known as a theme, the land theme, and the factor is subterranean fauna, and then the objective for subterranean fauna is to maintain representation, diversity, viability, and ecological function at the species population and assemblage level. So that can be pretty tri tricky, obviously, but that's the aim. And we don't obviously have the information in every situation to consider, you know, the genetics or the population. It, it depends on the information we have. But that dictates what information needs to be provided by the proponent. So why are they concerned to the EPA? Because subterranean fauna aren't a concern in a number of the other states in Western Australia. Um, and, you know, part of... Part of that is due to the age um, of the rocks in Western Australia, the endemism and the sorts of things that Mark talked about yesterday, which I won't um, repeat. So basically decisions must conform to the requirements of the Act. All species, all of them, are unique to Western Australia. Most of them have small and limited distribution, being short range in, some of them short range endemics, and as a result they're very vulnerable to impacts. And they may, um, they may be functionally important, but we don't know a lot of that information. Um, they're of global significance. And the other thing is we are actually geologists, and that was the first time it really came to mind, um, and the first time it was considered. And it was actually for a quarry um, up in Cape Range. And as a result of that, the EPA prepared, uh, they commissioned uh, a report at on, specifically on that area, which is still on their website today. Um, they then released guidelines, um, consideration of subterranean fauna, and it was specifically in groundwater caves. Um, and that was guidance statement 54. Subsequently, they reduced advice on how to sample subterranean fauna, and that's still relevant today, although it's in the process of being updated. Um, in 2011, yeah, in 2011, there was there'd been um, various issues had arisen as a result of subterranean fauna assessment, both with proponents, um, the conservation movement, um, and various difficulties. So the EPA agreed to adopt um, a more or pursue a more risk-based approach to future assessments of subterranean fauna, and I'll explain that later. Um, through that process, um, there was a discussion paper, and then subsequently, the current EAG which is um, guidance uh, 12. Okay, so why did they change? Why did they change from the risk-based approach? This is the original document that was prepared, but it was for cave environments. Basically, um, the resource in industry had concerns about the time it was taken to do the survey, and it was, um, they wanted a more timely process um, to suit you know, their requirements. Um, the regulators were struggling with the information they were provided. It wasn't giving them the confidence in the decisions necessarily. And the perceptions that survey requirements 
were costly um, and the monitoring, some of it was unnecessary. So at that point in time, there's a requirement that if um, a proponent found a species in the impact area only, they had to keep surveying outside until they found it. So there could be endless rounds of sampling, but they didn't necessarily come up with any more information. So, you know, it was time consuming and it wasn't giving us any answers. So, um, and one of the key problems was the information people were collecting wasn't being used and provided and becoming part of the state knowledge. It wasn't contributing to that. Um, so a lot of this information, it was collected, it was kept by the consultants or the proponents and that was it. It was never used again. Okay, so how did it happen? Just quickly, um, a discussion paper was put out. There was a steering committee set up to oversee that. It was put out. It was put out for a four week public comment period. So the public, there was extensive cons um, came in and they were reviewed. Through that review process and as a result of that, the environmental assessment guideline, which is the policy, um, was developed. And that was developed um, with an overarching technical advisory group. And then a draft document was put out. That was put out publicly for eight weeks. And then at the end of the public comment, the public comments were considered. And that included proponents, consultants, uh, non-government organisations. And then a final, final report was released, which is that one there. OK, so, but it was a really um, tricky issue, subterranean fauna. There was a lot of politics around it, a lot of concern. Um, so one of the key things was the consultation that went on. And the steering committee that was set up was really important. It included the chairman of the EPA. It included a member of the EPA who was specifically interested in genomics. It included the chief scientist, which it's unheard of that the chief scientist would be on a committee like this. But this was to make sure, at the end of the process, that, you know, that it had some authority and that people were happy with how it was done. They might not necessarily, everyone might not be happy with the outcome, but people were confident that it had been done in a proper process. Then there was this chap, I don't know who he is, some chap sat at the back there who spoke yesterday. And then um, there was this guy, Link Schmidt, who was a geneticist, because we wanted to use genetics a lot more in the process. So then there was a technical advice group that was, they were, made up of expertise. It didn't matter where they were from in terms of organisations, they were there on the basis of their expertise. Then there was a huge amount of um, consultation went on in the form of presentations beforehand, presentations um, following the, the release of the document, training people and explaining how they should use it. And one of the key things, I've only picked on one, but one of the key things that came out in every submission to both the discussion paper and the guidance statement was the problem with specimen data and its availability. And Mark did briefly touch on this. There was a complete lack of available data for key issues. And the problem is, without the data, you know, we couldn't look at um, cumulative impacts, we couldn't look at a whole series of things, basics like species distribution, or even know whether a species was new. We had consultants who let us know that they were they were working for various different companies and they were actually sampling the same borehole for the two different companies and they weren't allowed to share the information. We had situations where companies were finding a species, they weren't sending it to the museum, someone else would find a species, it was actually the same species, but they thought it was new, therefore it was treated very differently by the EPA. So it's absolutely critical, the information. So the new, the new approach, um, the, the aim is to make sure that the survey is focused on answering the key questions and to improve consistency across projects. Um, and that the other key to this was after reasonable sampling was undertaken, and we've got a, there's a, um, a sampling guide to explain what's regarded as reasonable, which I won't go into, but once that that's been undertaken. If it's not coming up with the answers for resolving the issues, then surrogates can be used. And just because of time, I won't go into surrogates. But So that was an alternative way of predicting the likely impacts. So as I said before, so all the samples as part of the new approach, 
all specimens, all the accompanying data, any DNA sequences, they all have to be offered to the museum. And they all have to be provided by the time the project's submitted to the EPA so that they can be validated. The reason it said offered is because the museum doesn't necessarily have the resources to actually take everything, so they select particular samples. Okay, so, so what does the EPA need to make an informed decision about subtraining for them? They use this information, this, this applies to all those different factors, whether it's flora and vegetation as well. So they need the project placing in a regional context for subtraining for them. They need survey within and outside the project impact area. And in terms of analysis and reporting of results, they need to include mapping. They need a mapping map of survey effort. And that needs to include the nil results where nothing's recorded in the bores, as well as where things are recorded in the bores. And that's critical because it tells us, you know, it, it may not mean there's nothing there, but it gives us an idea of, you know, a better idea of distribution. There needs to be a list of the species found. They need to map species distribution. And they need to identify those that are of conservation significance. And they may be listed species, or they may be species that are new, but of, and we don't necessarily know what they are, as Mark talked about yesterday, but we haven't found them anywhere else. And they also need to predict the impacts. Okay, so just to give you an idea of, of what we expect when we get a document on our desk. So, um, the first thing is that proponents use the guidance statement, which I've referred to. That gives them an idea of the standards they need and how they need to do it. But every project in Western Australia also has a scoping document. And that's specific to that project. So if there's anything in addition to the guidance or anything, any variation on the standard guidance, it's clearly outlined in the scope of document. So there's no doubting what work needs to be done. So obviously the extent of the work the, the, um, will, will depend on a number of things. It's going to depend on the complexity of the project and basically we consider the likely degree of impact and the likelihood of habitat supporting subterranean fauna. Because there's a lot of projects that it won't even be an issue, it won't be considered because there isn't any expectation that there's suitable habitat there. So these things I said before, they need to, um, when we look at a document, we check is, is the sample inside and outside, um, and does it represent, is it representative spatially of the extent of the proposal area, or if there's an aquifer, does it represent spatially the extent of the aquifer? And then there may be multiple sampling phases, and that will depend on the complexity. Okay, so just quickly, so a proposal comes in, the proposal is reviewed. Now a lot of work is done pre-referral, so we'll sit down with proponents, we'll go through the work they need to do, so a lot of that may well have been done up front before it's referred into the EPA. The EPA will then review it and they'll check, is further information required? And it may not be. Is additional sampling required? Or do they need to do further analysis to demonstrate where they've used a surrogate that there is connectivity between the habitats, between the habitat inside and elsewhere, which would indicate, which we're, we're suggesting, would mean that the subterranean fauna that occur in one spot, if the, you can demonstrate connectivity through gene flow or um, physical habitat, would occur outside. Therefore, it's not such an issue for impact assessment. So determine the impacts, then the outcomes. And these are key. So in the outcomes, there's a recommendation at the end of it by the EPA that it's either acceptable, it's unacceptable, in the case of Visa A that Mark referred to, or it's acceptable but it might need conditions. And the condition might be exclusion areas, which we talked about earlier. Research, so it may be further research is needed on a particular species or an assemblage. And, and the proposal can proceed, provided that work is done as well. Or it might be an offset and then it's reported to the minister. Okay, so these are just a couple of examples. Um, this is Kadadri um, here. This is in the Pilbara banded iron formation. It was a large mine footprint, 19,000 hectares. Um, and it's, the operation will be at least 30 years. So through that process, 
they found 15 troglar fauna species. Only nine of them were recorded within the proposed pit boundary, so the impact area. And subterranean fauna was deemed a key fact, environmental factor, linking back to that slide I showed you right at the beginning with all the different ones. <coughs> So this is an example. This was a really complex project. And each of these, where the blue um, lines are, each of these represent three different pits. And what they found, the company and the consultant, and it was really top quality work. So what they found was for each of these different pits, the troglofauna communities were different. They were unique. And there was very little different, very, very few, of the, the species that occurred inside also occurred outside, and these were these were individual these were um, species that were, were found as singletons, like an individual specimen. Some of these were species that were found multiple times, so that would indicate to us it's even more significant if you're finding something only in a particular area, but through multiple specimens. So it presented a lot of problems. So. The consultants did a lot of work, the proponents did a lot of work. It was all very good work. The survey well and truly exceeded the EPA's requirements. But they weren't asked to do that. They chose to do that in an effort to try and work out what was going on to make it easier for the impact assessment. But despite that, they couldn't demonstrate the connectivity, habitat connectivity. And so the EPA were concerned about um, the, that they, they made predictions, they indicated there was connectivity, but the EPA didn't have the confidence to make a decision based on those predictions alone. And the proponent will also continue to do more survey because they're not mining it straight away, and they might, may find in time, they, might find, they may find those species outside the impact zone. But at this point in time, they haven't done. So as a result of that, the EPA proposed um, exclusion zones um, to retain what we presumed was the trogla fauna habitat. So um, that's what's happened and the approval was conditional on the basis of those exclusion zones going ahead. Now if in the future the proponent does find it, <coughs> they could come back to the EPA, um, provide that information and depending how that went, um, they could put in um, a request to change, amend the proposal. But at this point in time, so this is another example, it's not iron ore, but it was just to give you an idea of, of the process again. So this is, this is up in the Tanami Desert, sort of East Kimberley. Um, it's complex desert geology, it's actually mixed rare earth deposits. It's a small mine, relatively short. Um, they, um, nine of the 20-foot-one Steiger fauna they found were only recorded in the impact area, and subterranean fauna was identified as a preliminary key factor. So this just shows you the pink blobs, these, that's, that's the survey they did. So they surveyed quite extensively along the aquifer. So they did a fair bit of survey. As a result of that survey, they did adequate survey, it was consistent with guidance. As a result of that, they identified extensive subterranean fauna, fauna habitat outside the impact area. And they demonstrated the connectivity using biological surrogates um, and also um, physical habitat. Surrogates. So they demonstrated it. As a result, subterranean fauna was no longer a factor in the assessment, so it wasn't even reported on. Um, and it was approved without any conditions. So uh, one of the keys for the guidance, for the, the policy, the EPA policy and guidance statement is it's trying to reduce the uncertainty and increase the level of confidence the EPA has in the assessment. So where you've got a low knowledge base and a high level of uncertainty, you're going to have high likelihood, assuming it's approved, you're going to have a high likelihood of prescriptive conditions with monitoring, offsets, exclusions, a whole series of things. So when you get to the top, if you've got high knowledge base, low levels of uncertainty, so your confidence is high, then you're much less likely um, to have conditions or have high conditions. Kadadri um, didn't fit that mold. They'd done extensive survey. It was excellent. But at the end of the day, um, the area was highly significant for subterranean fauna. Um, 
But it's not that often that that would happen in terms of to, to have done such extensive survey and found. Um, I think it was also because it was such a huge proposal, and and the the fauna is really unique, so it's important to make sure it gets that level of protection. So in summary, and I have three minutes left. Um, so the key for the EPA is making sure there's consistent survey and reporting standards so everybody knows what they have to do. Um, and it, it means for them that the impacts um, can be clearly determined. And applying the standards, as I said in the last slide, um, will improve the confidence in predictions because we know it's, it's um, the technical information is of a quality. That means we can have, um, you know, be certain of it. Um, and basically, you know, the benefit that for the um, consultant, oh, oh, wrong way, the benefit for the, the proponent is that it results in more timely decisions and time, timely decision making because we don't keep having to send the reports back to actually get good quality information. They do it up front, it's there, and you can go through the process, you know, relatively smoothly. So, and there's more consistency between projects because in Western Australia, all the different proponents are watching what the other proponents are doing. And so they're all keeping an eye on who's doing good work, who's not, and it becomes very apparent if somebody's managed to slip something through in the past that isn't such a good quality. Um, and it also impacts the consultants as well because it comes obvious which consultants are doing top quality work and which aren't. Um, and the other, this is critical, is, oh, I did it again, sorry is this one, future projects will benefit from greater availability of information and specimen data. That's absolutely critical because the more information we've got, the better we can understand the species we've got, their distribution and things like that. Um, and the other critical thing, the most important thing, is that at the end of the day, it gives us better environmental impact assessment, better outcomes, um, and the outcomes for subterranean fauna Look, a uh, Bridget, thank you very much for your fantastic presentation and for to fit the time. Ricardo, you must learn with Bridget how to. Okay, uh, Bridget, we have we have time for some questions. Uh, I have a question for you. Not in fact a question, just uh, understand. Uh, I think the biggest difference between us in Brazil and EPA in Australia is the capacity of EPA to accumulate it and to manage knowledge. You put all the results, all the, the information you receive along the histories of the license process, and you have a lot of information and accumulated. Here in Brazil, as uh, Ibama told to us this morning, every project is considered itself as a project. There is no a broader vision, there is no accumulate vision, even about the impacts. No? So, uh, I'd like to start the, the conversation, start the, the debate with a comment from you about this process of accumulation of knowledge inside the environmental authorities. Thank you. Sorry, inside where? Inside the EPA, inside. Oh, okay. uh, um, well, we would probably say we're not that good at accumulating knowledge. Um, this is something we've been grappling with, and a lot of it is to do with our systems. Um, it, and there's a... The information on fauna is held um, at the museum where Mark works. The information on plants and vegetation is held in a different organisation at the herbarium. And then we hold all the proponents' reports and we hold all the technical reports, but not necessarily all the data that goes with them. We have, what I probably should have mentioned is that every single um, in project that's assessed by the EPA that goes out, one of the conditions is that they have to provide all the data it has to be publicly available as well. So all the data has to be provided. But So we've got that condition, but we don't always ask for it. The reason being we don't have somewhere to put it. So what's uh, recently been um, set up 
it was in October, and it's people have been trying to work on it for years. It's what's known as the WA Biodiversity Science Institute, and that's a collaboration of industry, research, um, non-government organisations, and government. And um, that's been funded by the Premier's department. And that, that there's a whole node related to information management and making sure we can do it better. So we do it to a small degree, but the difference is that people have to make it available. And it is on the website, but it's actually the raw data that we want. And we see it in the process, but and we have to but we haven't necessarily a central body to store it on. So that's what this new organisation is. They've got four different um, themes that they have to focus on, and that's one of them, to try and make sure we do it much better than we currently do. Thank you. So we have some questions. Uh, I think the first one is Dr. Clayton, you, Sanchez, and you, Dan. Clayton, no, Professor uh, Jonathan, you first. Um, a questão da colocação. Quando eu falei a questão da avaliação, ok. Quando eu falei da questão da colocação do projeto, foi na questão da avaliação do impacto ambiental daquele projeto. É, mas o IBAMA ele entende e aceita e, e busca os empreendedores quando vão desenvolver um estudo uma, uma base de dados que pode ser a base de dados de empreendimentos localizados, né, em vários empreendimentos. Então essa base de dados ela pode ser utilizada no estudo de impacto ambiental como uma complementação à avaliação de impacto ambiental na, na elaboração desse estudo. Um excelente, excelente comentário. E nós estamos com, é, desenvolvendo um sistema que o objetivo é que, que essa, essa base de dados esteja toda disponível. É, nessa base, né, para poder utilizar. Por exemplo, em Carajás, por exemplo, é, tanto o ICMBio como o IBAMA, isso já foi colocado várias vezes pelo próprio ICMBio, pelo chefe do ICMBio, que a, a base de dados, por exemplo, do meio biótico, não em relação à caverna, mas em relação às espécies, vai, de, de, já estão é, mais do que fartamente já disponíveis. Os estudos já estão disponíveis, já tem publicação em tudo. Então, você não precisa estar fazendo levantamento, matando bicho, para poder fazer esse tipo de levantamento. Professor Sanches? Sorry, can I just, just one thing I didn't say is we, it, when it's public available, it doesn't mean people necessarily have all the species, like there's obviously threatened listed species, locations, things like that, that aren't available to the public, you know, in order to protect those species. So it's not, it wouldn't be absolutely everything. Um, I have a straight forward question, but uh, let me make a quick comment as well. Please, go uh, ahead. Accumulating data and information is not the same as building knowledge. What we need is uh, knowledge to inform, properly inform decision making. And I think this is the meaning of your, uh, of, of your comment. But it's important to make a distinction between data, uh, information, which is a bit more than data, and of course, knowledge is what we really need to inform decisions. But my, oh, sorry. Oh, so, so so the information management process and, um, is specifically set up so the data is there and it's the intent is that it's consistently collected and this isn't just EIA data, this is any biological data across the state, industry, academia and then the intent is that the, the questions that people have, the, what, what are known as the end users, so for us, that would be the EPA, or it might be the conservation bodies that need management information, or um, other organisations, or industry, so mining companies. And then the idea through this um, institute is that that information, that they want that question, they can put that to the um, academics that are involved, and then they get somebody doing a project so that they actually answer or try and provide some answers to the outcome that's being sought. So it's not just about the data, it's about the knowledge as well. And that there'd be a constant feedback loop where you know that's fed back in and you know the information used. But my question is uh, those guidance provide either recommendation or even a requirement for minimum times uh, for collecting uh, making samples and so on, specifically related to subterranean fauna. 
Is there a minimum time requirement? Or how do we manage this? How long do consultants need to spend in the field in order to collect enough information? Never rains in Australia. <laughs> well, it depends. For example, you might have two phases of survey. They have to go out at two different times of year, or they might go out. It depends which, whether it's trough or stygophore. A stygophore is not such an issue for me. But they, they'll go out, there might be the, the, the guidance will give, there's two separate guidance, there's the policy and there's the technical sampling one which is being updated. Um, and basically the technical one will give you information on techniques to use um, and it's very out of date at the moment for that because it's so old. Um, so it will give you techniques that should be used, um, it will give you how many phases of sampling you need to do, um, I'm trying to think what else, uh, a whole series of sort of different um, factors, I suppose, that you have to address. Now, you can choose not to address them. You don't have to do it that way. It's not saying this is the best way. It's saying this is the way we expect you to do it. If you do it differently, you have to explain why and justify it. So it gives you an idea about survey effort, basically, and techniques. Could you talk about your name? I didn't know it yet. Rodolfo do ITV, Emily. Great talk, Bridget. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first one, um, as you know, here in Brazil, the legislation to classify caves into the different relevance categories uh, takes into consideration both biological attributes and geological or cultural attributes. So my first question is whether you also consider geolo geological or cultural attributes when deciding whether a proposal is approved or not. And my second can question. I that? Can I answer that one first? Yeah. I might not remember the second one. So, the, no, we don't consider geological um, unless it's a particular landform, then we might. But generally, we don't consider geology. We, there, there's a degree of cultural um, issues that the EPA consider, but they're only um, from a. The, there's other departments that deal with. Um, Aboriginal heritage and things like that, but there is a small part of our act that says um, we have to deal with certain aspects, but it's only a very small part. So it's so, mainly biological attributes? Yeah, oh, air quality, um, hang on. There's a whole series of um, different things I can't find it right now, but yeah, so there's air quality, um, water quality, uh, what are all the others? Sorry, I only deal with the biological ones. But noise, noise pollution. Yeah, noise. Yeah, so hydrological processes, inland waters, human health, um, amenity, coastal processes. There's a whole series of marine ones, and heritage, which is where the cultural heritage would come in. But it is a sort of a smaller part of what the EPA does. Thanks. And my second question is. How do you estimate connectivity, or how do you expect the reports uh, prove there is or there isn't connectivity between caves? Okay. I knew they'd come in handy. I'll say that. Okay. Uh, I might get smart to talk about the genetic literature. Yeah. Like basically, Bridget, we could move to another question, uh, oh, and fine. you want Rodolfo this answer, okay? Guilherme, please. Okay, so my first question was touched upon, which was on data sharing, so we can go to the second one, which is, how do you take in the species list? Do you accept morphotypes as your final um, list, or do you do take in DNA evidence for classifying or putative species? Or 
Yeah, but basically they just need to have a code and we'll accept them. But we, we expect them to have been verified by the museum. So they will be checked to make sure. If there isn't something there that indicates they have been checked by evidence, then we check with the museum. And the museum will provide you with DNA evidence for that? Uh, not no, not, not necessarily, but the, the museum will occasionally check molecular evidence and, and the proponent, the EIA, is expected to include all the genetic data, the trees and the sequences in, in the report as well. So they can be verified externally if need be. Um, in answer to your question, we, um, if, if, the, if the proponent or the environmental company thinks that there are multiple species based on molecular evidence, based on, say, juveniles or cryptic species, perhaps, then all of that needs to be included in the report. And, and we can, we're sometimes asked to assess them, but the, the Office of the UPA can do that as well. Uh, Bridge, you'd like to back to the... the oh, design. did I get... Oh, I didn't realise it was changing up there. It was not changing when I was moving in. Um, I can't actually find the slide, but basically there's, there's two options that they have. And there's a lot of risks, and there was a lot of discussion about this during the development of the, um, the guide. So we've referred to it as surrogates, and they can either use a physical surrogate or a genetic surrogate. And with a genetic surrogate, they have to do genetics on species inside and outside, and they have to demonstrate a degree of gene flow. And that's that's the main... That's I think that... Well, I don't know what you think, but no, I think... We consider that's relatively easy. The one that there's a lot more dispute about is physical, because basically they have to demonstrate. They use geology. They use um, um, groundwater, various different things to try and demonstrate <coughs> that there's a link. And they have to demonstrate certain species might occur there and certain species might occur here. And they and what often happens is people look at geology and say, okay, well, the geology's inside, the geology's outside, therefore it's fine. But it's actually the habitat. So they have to try and demonstrate that the habitat there is the habitat there, outside, through various means. And one of the companies at the moment is actually putting boreholes down in, area, in various areas outside their area of impact. Not on a proposal that they're currently putting in. Um, and just looking at those bores to see um, the cause along the, the lines that Mark showed, that have the bugs in them, so they have the cavities and the little gaps, just to try and find out if those bugs there are supporting similar things to there. So they've gone around and they've actually um, drilled bores specifically looking for it. They're the first people to do it. Um, and then they've actually sampled to see if they, you know, see what species are there to see if they can find it out. So it's very early stages. It's very new, but it was a way of trying to get beyond the constant sampling outside to find a single species that wasn't coming up with results. Um, yeah. Uh, Bridget, unfortunately, you have to move forward. Thank, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for attending the event. It's an honor for us to have you here. It's a you. great pleasure. Thank you very much. Good.